A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baringold Don't Know There was once upon a time a king whose wife, the queen, became mother in the palace of a little son called Dan, and at the same time, even to a minute, a mare in the stable had a little foal. Therefore the king gave the foal to his son Dan. When the young prince was old enough, he was sent to school, where he learned to read and write and cipher. Now not a single day passed, but before going to school he went into the paddock where was his foal, and talked to it, and patted it. Now it happened that war broke out, and the king was obliged to go to battle, and he entrusted his queen and boy to the care of a prime minister. Now the queen was a wicked woman, and she entered into a plot with the prime minister to seize on the reins of government, and to establish herself sole sovereign in the land. But because the prince was very clever and observant, the prime minister had to be very cautious lest his plans should be found out. And as the Prime Minister schemed to get the King killed and then to marry the Queen, he determined also to get rid of the Crown Prince. And in order to do this, he put a dagger in his bed with the point upwards, so that when Prince Dan went to bed, the dagger might pierce him through. Now the little Prince went as usual into the paddock to stroke his little horse, and he saw it looked sad and woebegone. So he said to it, Little horse, what ails you today? But as the groom was by, the foal only hung his head and said nothing. Now when school was over, Prince Dan came back to see his little horse, and again he asked, Little horse, what ails you today? Then the foal said, Nothing ails me, but the Prime Minister wants to kill you. Then he told the Prince of the plan for his murder, and he told him what he was to do that night. So when darkness came on, Dan would not go to bed at all, but slept on the sofa. The Prime Minister saw he had failed in this scheme, but thought he would poison Dan with toffee, for of toffee the Prince was passionately fond. Next day, as he went to school, he visited the foal, and the little horse said to him, My king's son, be on your guard and take no toffee. And he told him the plan of the prime minister. When the prince came home, he was offered some delicious-looking toffee, but he refused to touch any. Then the prime minister saw that this scheme of his was unavailing. So he went to the queen, and he said to her, Tidings have just arrived that the king is unexpectedly returning, and we are not yet prepared for his destruction. And I believe that Dan's foal tells him everything. Now, pretend to be very ill, and say that the doctors order you the heart of the foal as the sole thing that will set you on your feet again." Now very soon the king arrived, and was sorry to find the queen ill, and she told him all that the prime minister had put in her mouth. Then the king said, "'Certainly I will have the foal killed, and you shall eat its heart. Only wait until Dan returns from school, that he may say good-bye to his little horse.' Now the king walked to meet Dan as he came back from school, and told him that he must kill the foal. So Dan said, Certainly, dear father, you must do what you see fit. Only, first of all, let me pull on my riding breeches, and take my little whip, and gallop round the paddock once on my little horse's back. Then Dan ran to his foal, that looked sad and woebegone, and told it what his father had said, and what he had desired. The foal said to him, Call for a glass of wine, and then drink to your father's health and the failure of your mother's and the Prime Minister's plans. Then jump on my back. I will carry you far away. He did so. When he had pulled on his riding breeches and taken his whip, he asked for a glass of wine, and kneeling before his father, said, "'I drink to your health, father, and to the failure of my mother and the Prime Minister's plans who have sought to dethrone you and to kill me!' Then he jumped on his foal's back, and away, away he rode. Now when the king had heard those words, he wondered and examined into the matter, and then all came out. So he had the Prime Minister hung, and he put the Queen in prison. In the meantime, the little horse had galloped away, away over land and sea, and never halted till it came to England, and to the city of London. There at the outskirts it halted, and said, Now go into the town, but never speak any other word but don't know to whatever is asked you till I give you leave. The prince promised this, and leaving his foal in a meadow outside London, he went alone into the great town. Those who met him asked him who he was, but he answered only, Don't know. They inquired of what country he was. He replied only, Don't know. They further asked his occupation. He said only, Don't know. Now after a day or two, it was told the king that there was a handsome lad going about London who could say no other words but don't know. So he sent for him and asked him his name, and received the answer, Don't know. Very well, said the king, be it so. You shall be called Don't Know. Then he sent him into the kitchen to be scullion there, but gave strict orders to the cook not to maltreat him in any way. Now it was usual for the servants to go to church on Sundays, and only one to remain at home and prepare dinner. When it came to be Prince Dan's turn to be alone in the kitchen, then he took ashes and strewed it all over the meat. When the cook came home, he was angry to see the good meat all spoiled. He said, 
"'Why, what have you done this for?' Dan replied, "'Don't know.' "'Do you know that you deserve a good hiding?' "'Don't know.' But as the king had ordered the lad was not to be maltreated, the cook did not dare to beat him. But he went to the king and begged that he might be taken out of the kitchen and put elsewhere. So the king placed him with the gardener. Now it was custom in the garden for the gardeners to go to church on Sunday, and one to remain behind to guard the garden. When it came to be Dan's turn to be at home, then his little horse came trotting up to him, and he brought him a bridle, and said, "'Shake the bridle, and at once you will have a splendid horse to ride, and grand clothes to put on.' So Dan shook the bridle, and immediately a chestnut horse stood before him with a red suit of clothes over the saddle, and all the accoutrements were of copper. Then Dan jumped on his back, and rode round and round the garden, till all the beds were trampled and spoiled. Then he leaped off the horse, which vanished along with the splendid red garments Dan had worn. Now it fell out that the king's third daughter, the youngest of his children, had not gone to church that day, as she had a bad cold. She had been looking out of the window, and saw all that had happened. When the gardeners came back from church, they were very angry, and they said to Dan, "'Who's been here spoiling the flower beds?' "'Don't know.' "'Why did you not keep proper guard?' "'Don't know. "'Were you asleep or awake?' "'Don't know.' "'I hope,' said the head gardener, "'that you know one thing, which is that you deserve a hiding.' "'Don't know. "'It took a dozen men a whole week to put the garden in order again, "'and a month before any flowers grew in it. "'Then again it came to Dan's turn to remain at home "'while the rest went to church. "'The princess had told no one of what she had seen.' Again, she had a cold, and so she remained at home. And this is what she saw. No sooner were all at church, and Dan thought himself alone, than he went into the garden and shook the bridle, whereupon a white horse appeared with a white suit of clothes adorned with silver over the saddle. Dan drew on the suit, jumped into the saddle, and rode up and down the garden, trampling all the beds. When he was tired, he jumped off, and at once the horse and the white clothes disappeared. The princess had seen all this. When the gardeners came home and saw the mischief done, they were very angry, and they asked, "'Why did you not keep proper guard?' "'Don't know.' "'Who have been in the garden making this mess?' "'Don't know.' You may well believe that if the king had not given strict injunctions to the contrary, they would have beaten Prince Dan black and blue. Again, the princess said nothing, and resolved on the same Sunday in the next month to pretend to be unwell, so as to stay at home and see what would happen. Now when the Sunday came, when it was Dan's turn to keep guard, the princess remained in the palace. This time she opened her window, and leaned forth to see the better. Dan shook the bridle, and immediately a yellow horse appeared, and over the saddle was a dress of cream colour, all woven with gold thread. He jumped into the saddle, and rode up and down and around the garden, and when he came near an open window, where was the princess, then he leaped on the saddle, and kissed her on the mouth. Now when he had ridden sufficiently, he dismounted, and instantly horse and garments vanished. When the gardeners returned, they were furious. "'Who has been here? There are horse hoof prints!' don't know. How is it you don't know? Did you keep your eyes shut? Don't know. Well, the king thought it was high time to have his three daughters married, so he had them advertised in all the daily papers. Wanted. Three desirable husbands for three eligible princesses. Must be of royal blood, good-looking, cleanly in their habits, and not given to chewing or smoking or snuffing tobacco. Apply Buckingham Palace. NB, no postcards. The king was very amiable, and he said to his daughters, my dears, I positively don't want to force any undesirable husbands on you. I give you free liberty to pick and choose and take whomsoever you like. Any one, revered father, asked the youngest. Is not royal descent a sin qua non? So long as he is cleanly in his habits and person, and doesn't chew, snuff, or smoke, I will not insist on that requirement, said the king. Troops of princes came to London, all aspirants after the hands of the princesses, and every one was scrupulously clean, and none were devoted to tobacco. The king had them all trotted out in the yard before his daughters, and the eldest chose her husband, and then the second the same, both desirable princes. But the youngest did not find any to her mind, so she said to the king, "'Father, may I have one of the court?' "'By all means, if cleanly in his habits, and not addicted to the filthy habit of snuffing, chewing, or smoking tobacco.' "'Will you have them all up?' asked the princess. So all the court was brought forth and marched in the front yard of the palace before the princess, but not one pleased her. Then she said, Is every member of the court here? All but that miserable don't know, said the head gardener. Send for don't know, asked the princess, and the prince Dan arrived. Then she went straight up to him and kissed him on the mouth, and said, That's the boy for me. Now when the sisters and the princes who were to be their husbands saw and heard this, they were greatly shocked and offended. 
However, the king was so good-natured and his youngest daughter so persistent that there was no help for it, and the three princesses were married the same day. But as the two eldest sisters and their prince were extremely disgusted at the youngest sister's choice, and as they represented that it was not proper for them to live in the palace, the king had the potato house cleared out, in which the potatoes were usually kept through the winter, and fitted up as the house of Don't Know and his wife. Now one day, soon after the wedding, there was to be a hunt. So the two princes, as they rode out to the chase, passed the potato house and saw Don't Know outside. They laughed and said, Brother-in-law, are you coming out for some sport today? Don't know. We suppose you never rode a horse in your life? Don't know. Nor killed any game? Don't know. So away they went, laughing to each other about this silly brother-in-law of theirs. Now when they were gone, Dan shook his bridle, and at once the red horse appeared and the red and copper garment. He put it on and mounted, and away he went after his brothers-in-law. As he approached them, they did not know him, and they said to one another, Who is this great prince who rides this way? They waited until he came up, and then asked if he would join them. Now the horse had given him leave to speak whilst in his gay garments, so he answered and said, I have already chased. What have you caught? He held out a golden pheasant. Then the princes longed to be able to take this home with them and show it as their capture, so they begged him to give them the pheasant. He said he would do so if they would give him the rings off their fingers. To this they consented. They gave him their rings, and he gave them the golden pheasant and rode away, and got fast home, jumped off the red horse, and stood by the door of the potato house when they came home. As they drew nigh, the princes showed the golden pheasant and shouted, Brother-in-law, do you not admire our skill in the chase? Don't know, was all he answered. Next day there was to be another chase in the forest. The princes rode by the potato house and said, Brother-in-law, will you come out with us today? Don't know. But when they were gone, he shook the bridle, and immediately the white horse appeared, with the white suit of raiment adorned with silver. He mounted and rode after his brothers-in-law. They had been unsuccessful that day, and were discouraged. They said, Here comes that prince again, in most splendid raiment, and on a magnificent horse. Who can he be? When Dan came up, they saluted him respectfully, and asked if he would have sport with them that day. He replied that he had already been engaged in the chase, and had got a beautiful white swan. They were very desirous to have this, but he said he would take no money for it, only if they would allow him to heat their rings red hot and stamp the signets on their heads under the hair, then would he give up the snowy swan. They thought no one would see if branded under the hair, so they consented. He branded them both with their own seals, gave them up the swan, and galloped home. The horse in his white vesture disappeared, and as they came home they saw him lounging at the door of the potato house. They held up the beautiful swan and said, See, brother-in-law, what luck we have! Don't you wish you were as clever as we? Don't know. Ah, but you know you are a fool and we are wise. Don't know. They rode into the palace laughing, and got great credit for having killed the swan. Next day there was another hunting party. Again the princes laughingly taunted Dan. Will you come a-hunting, brother-in-law? Don't know. You haven't got a horse to ride, we suppose? Don't know. Nor bows and arrows? Don't know. But you know you are a fool. Don't know. When they were out of sight, he shook the bridle, and now a gold-yellow horse stood before him, and a splendid crocus-yellow garment woven with gold thread. He put on the dress, mounted, and galloped after the princes. When he drew near, they said to one another, Can this be the same prince we have seen twice before? They waited till he came up, and then saluted him with the profoundest respect, and inquired if that he would hunt with them that day. He replied that he had already done his hunting, and he showed them a gold fawn that he had killed. When the princes saw this, they were mad set to have the fawn, and they begged him to let them have it. But he said he would give it up only on condition that they each allowed him to brand them on the back with something. Well, they were so set on having the gold fawn that they agreed, and he burned on their backs the symbol of a pair of gallows. Then he rode home, and they changed everything before they arrived, and when they came, they bragged about their hunting and showed the gold fawn they had killed. You couldn't do this, could you, brother-in-law? they asked. He only replied from the door of the potato shed, Don't know. Now it happened that the great King Cuckoo of Ireland, who had been subject to the King of England, was so set on being independent, and even of subjugating England, that he gathered a great army, and came over and marched against London. The King sent out an army to oppose his advance under one of his sons-in-law, but it was defeated. Then he sent out another under the second, and that was defeated also. So now the king gathered together all the remnant of his forces, and determined to take the field in person. He would command the centre, and each of his son-in-laws the wings. The two princes went to the potato shed, and said, Come on, brother-in-law, the land is in danger. You must fight as well as we. Don't know, answered Dan. 
Don't you know how to handle bow or spear? Don't know. If we are defeated again, all will be up with every one of us, said the princes. Don't know, answered Dan. Now as soon as they had marched out of London, Dan shook the bridle, whereupon his own little horse came trotting up to him, and he had on his back three portmanteaus. He said to his master, See, take these portmanteaus. In one is an army of soldiers, in another are munitions of war, in the third is plenty of money. The day is going against the king. Quick, put on the suit of armour you see provided, jump on my back, and ride to the rescue of your father-in-law, but first unpack the portmanteaus. So Dan immediately opened the leather boxes, and when he had opened the first, out marched an army of men, and when he had opened the second, out rolled cannons and cannonballs, and hay for the horses and food for the men, and when he had opened the third, he found in it gold, wherewith to pay the soldiers, and gold is said to be the sinews of war. So he mounted his little horse, and rode at the head of his army to the battlefield, and he arrived just as the centre was giving way, and when the two wings were turning to flight. He rushed forward with his men, and fell on King Cuckoo with his Irish, and utterly rooted them, and took their banner, on which was inscribed, Home Rule Forever, and sent the Irish flying, tumbling, head over heels, away, away, as fast as their legs could run, in the direction of their native isle. Now as soon as he had gained the victory, he hastily withdrew with all his men, till he had got behind a belt of trees. Then he packed all his troops once more into their portmanteau, and put in all the munitions of war into the second, and returned as quickly as he could to London, jumped off his little horse, and stood lounging at the door of his potato shed, when the king and the princes and the army returned, playing and singing and whistling and dancing, Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves, Britons never, never, never will be slaves, least of all to Paddy. And as the princes passed by the door where stood Dan, Aha, brother-in-law, they said, Where were you today when we gained the victory over King Cuckoo? Don't know. What would you have done had you been in battle? Run away, of course. Don't know. And where would you be now but for our victorious arms? Don't know. A grand banquet was given that evening and much wine was drunk, and toasts were proposed, and the two princes bragged of what they had done, and no one said a word about the mysterious assistance that had been given just as fortune had declared against the English arms. But presently the king got up on his feet, and at once everyone began to hammer on the table and say, Hear, hear! Then the king said, Ladies and gentlemen, princes and princesses of the blood royal, duke and marquesses and earls and viscounts and barons and baronets and knights and squires, and all in your several degrees, I hope you will listen to the few words I venture to utter. Hear, hear! And one of the princes thundered out, Encore! I have listened, said the king, with surprise, and I am fain to admit sorrow, and heard every one present boasting about his great deeds, and no one saying a word about that gallant and most mysterious hero who seemed to drop from the clouds, and without whom we should have been compelled to, to, to cut and run. No, 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 no! Yes, I repeat it, said the king. The wings under the masterly direction of my son-in-laws had received the order right about face, cut! The centre under my august self was giving way. No, 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 no! It is of no use shutting our eyes to facts, pursued his majesty. We should have been jolly well licked! He paused. The expression was hardly diplomatic. He corrected it to, We should have met with a serious reverse, but for the assistance of our mysterious ally. I drink, gentlemen and ladies, princes of the blood royal, dukes, etc., to the very good health of our deliverer this day. Uh, by the way, added the king, sitting down, where is uh, son-in-law number three? Every one of the guests looked in everyone else's face and said, Don't know. And the servants behind the guests looked about the grand banqueting hall, and they also said, Your most gracious majesty, don't know. And the footman on the stairs looked up and down the staircase, and the porter at the gate looked at them, and they at him, and said, Don't know. Just then was heard martial music. A magnificent band was heard playing, and the tune that was being played was, See the conquering hero comes. And presently large bodies of soldiers appeared, infantry and cavalry, in magnificent uniform, and surrounded the palace, and then, riding on a golden-coloured horse in golden armour, with a white horse at his side, on which rode a lady in cloth of silver, came a prince. He was attended by a number of equerries and staff officers, and he descended from his horse at the palace gates, gave his hand to the princess, let her alight, and then strode up to the gates. The porter said, Your name, sir? Don't know. Then the porter, who had quite lost his head all the magnificence, said to the first footman, His Serene Highness don't know. 
and the first footman shouted to the second, "'His Highness down now!' and the second shouted to the third with great emphasis, "'His august high and mightiness don't know!' And so the announcement ran up the stairs, but with a few strides the newcomer reached the top of the grand state stairs, and the princess with him, and they walked into the banqueting hall, and lo, everyone stood up and cheered, for they recognised the conqueror in that day's battle. Then Prince Dan, for it was he, bowed his knee to the king, and said, Sire and father-in-law, I am the youth who has for all this while answered to every question asked me, don't know. Now I am released by my little horse from the necessity of making this answer. Why imposed on me, you goodness only knows, but I made the promise, and a promise, sire and father-in-law, is, I need hardly say, a promise, and must be kept. I am of royal blood, being the son of the very puissant king of Cloudland. I came here, and here your youngest daughter chose me to be her husband. Your two other princes, son-in-laws, are humbugs. Here are their rings and I took from them. If you will lift up their hair, you will see them branded with their own signets. If you will strip their coats off their backs, you will find them marked with a pair of gallows between their shoulder blades. If you have the least doubt, sire and father-in-law, that it is I who assisted in this glorious day, here is your own pocket handkerchief which you gave me. In the midst of the fray, I was slightly wounded in the arm. When you saw the blood flow, you pulled out your red silk pocket handkerchief and insisted on binding it about my arm. I restore it to you. I am healed. The kingdom of Great Britain is henceforth safe from the humiliation of annexation through subjugation to the neighbouring isle." There was immense applause, and even the humble princes, the brothers-in-law, had sufficient grace to say, "'Encore! Encore!' Then the king said, "'It is obvious to me, and all, that I must make this victorious hero heir to my throne, though he has married only my youngest daughter. Hitherto we have only known him by the name of Don't Know. We would all like to know what is the real name by which he may be known in history." Now the writer of this story is fain to say that at this point his authorities fail him. In Cloudland the prince was indeed called Dan, but not so in English history. If therefore it be asked by what name this prince may be looked for in the catalogue of English sovereigns, he is obliged to admit, don't know. Don't Know is a Hungarian folk tale from the collection of George Gyle, translated by Steer Peths N.D. The affinity of sympathy between the prince and his horse is not an uncommon feature in such tales. The story of the service to the King of England, and of the mysterious horses on which the prince rides to hunt and to deliver the king from his foes, occurs also in the far older tale of Robert the Devil, which can be traced back to the early Middle Ages, and to which indeed William the Conqueror is said to have alluded before the Battle of Hastings in his address to his soldiers. End of section 14. Recording by Sophie Owen.